Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. I'm glad that you've tuned in today. I trust that you're having a good summer. I don't know about you, but I love the heat, so I'm going to throw that your way a little bit. I want to say that I appreciated Pastor Andrew's message from last week, and if you haven't heard it, please go back and listen. Um, just some fantastic stuff there. And uh, today, we are going to jump into something, uh, what I would call odd, a little odd in some cases, but... Uh, Well, the reason I say it's odd, because it's a song in popular culture, but yet it's a song about God. Now, before we go any further, I want to start off by asking, as uh, we allow our faith to motivate and inform uh, how we navigate the world around us, here's a question I want to throw at you. How should we as Christians engage with pop culture? Think about that for a bit. And again, this is the underlying premise of this entire series that we're looking at entitled Summer Playlist. How should we as Christians engage with pop culture? Now, the Bible says in Psalm 24 verse 1 that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Now, everything includes culture. It's it's covered by God's sovereignty. And we believe that by God's grace in this world, believers and unbelievers alike are capable of creating beautiful things. Includes music, songs, movies, TV shows, and so much more. And as we allow our faith to inform how we navigate the world around us, how should we as Christians engage with pop culture? Now, I may make some suggestions this morning, but before we jump into our song, here they are. First of all, I think we need to engage in the culture around us with curiosity. Uh, Because culture is included under God's creation and sovereignty, I think we have an obligation to approach it with a number of questions. Does it echo the gospel in some fashion? Do we hear the gospel in in, in pop culture? Does it evidence our need for the good news? In other words, is there something that we're craving? Does it contradict our understanding of the world in a way that deserves a loving response? And I think these types of questions, what they do is they allow us to consider that piece of culture on its own terms and then ask how it might sit alongside our faith. I think these are very important things that we have to do. What happens uh, that we can appreciate the parts that resonate with our faith while learning more about the world and our shared humanity when we find ourselves immersed in this stuff? Again, pop culture is all around us. We should have a genuine curiosity. We should begin to ask questions. Secondly, we should engage the culture around us with grace. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I know of a lot of people who, who would call themselves Christians, but they function a little bit lacking in the grace area, especially when it comes to culture. Colossians 4, 5, and 6, it tells us, Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be seasoned with, uh, full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Just as all of our conversations should be seasoned with love, our discourse around pop culture should offer grace and space for those with differing opinions and differing beliefs. To put it plainly, we can't expect a non-Christian piece of art to align with all of our Christian values. We can't. But we can look for ways that God's truth and beauty might be present in very unlikely places. And finally, we should engage the culture around us with discernment. Discernment. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Paul touches on something so crucial to our Christian lives. The Bible doesn't say don't watch non-Christian movies or listen to non-Christian music or whatever, nor does it give us a checklist of what makes TV shows acceptable for Christians or detail how many hours of video games a Christian should play. However, the Bible does tell us that God has given us a spirit of discernment and wisdom. So every Christian informed by Scripture should prayerfully cons- make their own decisions about what pieces of pop culture are beneficial and constructive for them. And just as we should be gracious towards non-believers, we should extend the same grace to our brothers and sisters in Christ who may have different boundaries than we do. And as you consider how you can meaningfully engage pop culture with curiosity, with grace, and with discernment, 
I would ask that you would pray that God would give you the eyes and the, the eyes to see and the ears to hear whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Kind of sounds like Philippians 4.8. So now, let's jump into our song. Our song this week is entitled Nobody. It's by Selena Gomez. Now, she was born in 1992 in Texas, and uh, she quickly began to rise. And by 2002, she was appearing on the famed television show, the one that my boys love so much, uh, Barney and Friends. Um, she shifted from acting to singing over time, like most many people do. And by the age of 16, she signed a record deal with Hollywood Records. In 2009, Gomez recorded the album Kiss and Tell with her band The Scene. And by 2013, she went solo and recorded her first solo album called Stardance. And subsequently, she recorded her second album called Revival in 2015 and her third album, which was called Rare, just in 2020. When you do your study of Gomez, we see that she is diagnosed with lupus sometime between 2012 and 2014. In September of 2017, she revealed on Instagram that she had withdrawn from public events during the previous months because she had received a kidney transplant. It was during that transplant that an artery broke and emergency surgery surgery was conducted to building a new artery using a vein from her leg. Gomez began to be very transparent. She began to open up about her struggles with both anxiety and depression. She began pursuing therapy in her early 20s and uh, spent time in treatment facilities. None of this is a secret. It's all out there. In April of 2020, she revealed that she had bipolar disorder. So here is a young lady, very transparent with everything that's been going on in her life. Now, she grew up in a Catholic home. She's recording, uh, she recorded saying that in 2017 that she didn't like the term religion and that it, sometimes it freaks her out, I quote. And she went on to add, she says, I don't know if it's necessarily that I believe in religion as much as I believe in faith and a relationship with God. Now again, you've heard me say this time and time again, um, musicians, artists, actors, they, they have a stage and people listen. And this is what she's been saying. Uh, One day she was interviewed on a television show. It was with Elvis Duran and the Morning Show is what it was called. And the conversation started and it ended on the subject of church, specifically at that time, Hillsong, New York. And uh, during the interview, the uh, um, host, Duran, he actually joked how the paparazzi caught Selena leaving church on on Sunday instead of doing something inappropriate. (coughs) Excuse me. Now, uh, Selena Gomez is not shy about her Christian faith. And she even told Duran during the interview that she values faith and vulnerability. Um, she, say, she said this. She says, I haven't, been really, I haven't really been all over the place lately, and that's kind of intentional. I think it's important to balance out where I am. I've been doing this for a really long time, and my sanity has meant everything to me. And a lot of that is my faith. Gomez goes on to reveal more of her spiritual and Christian side by associating with churches and pastors. She shared um, some of her struggles. She even quoted from a sermon by Pastor Judas Smith, who leads City Church in Los Angeles, California. So Gomez then went on, and in 2015, she put a worship song on her album, Revival. And she went out and she actually sang it, if you're into the Christian music scene, with the Hillsong Young and Free, and it was at a concert in L.A. And so what happened is, unbeknownst to all the people in attendance, uh, Gomez shows up and gets on stage, and when she took the stage, she started by saying this. Tonight is more than a concert. It's more than Hillsong. It's more than me coming on stage and singing a song for you. It's about a relationship that is greater than anything. I wrote this song about the one thing that holds it all together for me, even when I can't bear to do it myself. And she continued on. She said, the song is called Nobody. And eventually a fan asked her on Twitter uh, what inspired her to write the song Nobody. And and Gomez's reply was, nobody is about God. It's about him. Now, Gomez has two songs with similar titles and even similar lyrics. However, they have very different meanings. So, she, refer- she first recorded Nobody Does It Like You in 2013, which is clearly about a relationship 
in my humble opinion, it's clearly uninspiring and meaningless. Just saying, just throwing it out there. Um, and when you think about it, for somebody who just dated Justin Bieber for a long time, one would assume that she would probably have deeper feelings for him than just loving his bad boy ways. But that's just me saying and giving a music critique. Anyway, she recorded Nobody in 2015. And some people actually believe that this track solidifies her faith in God. And again, by her own admission, her life has changed after entering rehab. And she ended up ditching most of her friends and has been actually attending church regularly. So here we have a pop culture star who has encountered faith and has made decisions and has now written a song that has been not only impactful to her, but to her listeners. The second verse in the song, and you, if you haven't heard it already, please give it a listen, but the second verse in the song goes like this. It says, No oxygen could barely breathe. My darkest sin you raised release. And it's all because of you, all because of you. I don't know what it is, but you've pulled me in. No one compares, could even begin to love me like you do. I wouldn't want them to because nobody's going to love me like you do. Nobody, nobody, nobody's going to love me like you do, like you. I actually think she was onto something here. You know, it's, it's interesting that sometimes a, 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 an artist can actually, with very simple words, have some great theology. And truly, when you look at this, there is nobody like Jesus. She says it very clearly. There is no greater person that has ever walked the earth than Jesus. And she's testifying that by her song. And you could never have a big enough view of him. There is nobody like Jesus. And here's a couple of reasons that you can write down that I, why I want to say this. Well, first of all, Jesus is unique in his historical verification. I've said this time and time again, again at Easter. But when we read the history books, we often assume that historical records can easily verify ancient historical fiction figures such as Alexander the Great or Plato or Julius Caesar. Well, that's really not true. There are very few ancient manuscripts that exist that confirm the reality of any ancient history maker. So especially books or parchments that go back over a thousand years. Now, Jesus is different. First, there are 27 different New Testament sources that describe his life and ministry. Second, his life is mentioned by numerous non-biblical authors such as uh, Cornelius Tatticus, born in uh, AD 52 or 54, they're not sure. The great Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, born in AD 37. Suetonius, who was a Roman uh, historian. And even the Jewish Talmuds themselves, which were written post 100 AD. Uh, if you go to something like the you know, Encyclopedia Britannica, it uses over 20,000 words to describe Jesus. Those are more words to describe Jesus than used for Aristotle, Cicero, Alexander, Julius Caesar, Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, and Napoleon Bonaparte combined. There is unequaled and undeniable proof that Jesus of Nazareth walked this earth some 2,000 years ago. Number two, Jesus is unique in the prophecies related to his life and work. His life purpose was announced by numerous prophets hundreds of years before his coming, and he came roughly about 5 or 6 uh, B.C. The Old Testament contains over 300 references to the Messiah that could have been fulfilled only in uh, the person of Jesus. These included that he would be a Jew from the tribe of Judah and the family line of David, born in David's hometown of Bethlehem. Prophecies foretold that he, uh, um, that he would be preceded by a messenger. Isaiah 40, 30 talks about betrayed by a close friend in Psalms, sold for 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah, crucified with thieves in Psalms in Isaiah, and also buried in a rich man's tomb, according to Isaiah 53, 9. The... Uh, professor of mathematics and astronomy, and he's also an author, his name is Peter Stoner, he states in, in an article called Science Speaks that the odds of Jesus' fulfilling only eight of the major prophecies are one in the 10 to the 17th power. And he goes on and he concludes that the prophets had just one chance in the 10th to the 17th power of having them come true in any man, but they all came true in Christ. And so we have to allow that scientific probability to sink deeply into our hearts. That Jesus' claim to be the Messiah has no parallel 
in history. Third, his, his unique, uh, he's unique in his birth. He's unique and utterly, it's unique and utter, um, miraculous, I guess. Uh, his unique and utterly miraculous birth is celebrated all over the world, obviously, each Christmas. Um, two detailed, amazingly detailed accounts of uh, the circumstances are recorded in Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. And so besides the angel Gabriel announcing the birth, the extreme humility of being born in a place that was strictly reserved for animals, or the choir of angels that sang and startled the shepherds, like Jesus who being conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a woman who is a virgin, is unique in human experience. But this too was prophesied in Isaiah 7.14. You know, do we know of any other virgin births or any other child conceptions that produce a life anywhere near that of who Jesus Christ was? Jesus was fully God and fully man. God himself had taken on human form. You know, can we imagine anything more wondrous than the incarnation? And this act exemplified the greatest act of humility of all time, that God stooped to become part of his fallen creation. Number four, Jesus is unique in his supernatural powers. If anything stands out in the four Gospels in the life of Jesus, it's God's love expressed through miracles that freed and benefited people. The book of Mark contains a fast-paced stories in which Jesus heals people's diseases, casts out demons, multiplies food for thousands, even raises people from the dead. The book of John builds his case on miracles that demonstrated the power and divinity of Jesus. And a careful study of the New Testament reveals at least 30 amazing signs and wonders that Jesus performed while on earth. And no other person validated his ministry by supernatural means as Jesus did, who, according to Acts 10, went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Number five. Jesus is unique in his perfectly holy life. You know, he... Jesus remains to this day the only person who backed up his claims by a sinless life. When questioned about his teachings or his unique moral authority, Jesus responded humbly and confidently to his accusers. And in John 8, which of you convicts me of sin, he asked. And of course, nothing but deafening silence followed. Jesus makes it very clear that all those who followed him, that the secret to his success was found in his perfect obedience to his heavenly Father. In John 8, he said, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. You know, did any other human being say no? <laughs> when you think about it, did I, or, you know, dare to make that claim? History and personal experience say, no, there was no one else. See, Jesus wasn't just a mere man. He was God in human form. Interesting enough, even Napoleon Bonaparte, he acknowledged the fact that, uh, when he said this of Jesus. He said, I know men, and I'll tell you that Jesus Christ is no, is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire on love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Bonaparte understood that. Number six, Jesus is unique in his teachings. As a matter of fact, many of the world's most memorable sayings and teachings come from the lips of Jesus. The very powerful and impactful words of Jesus, beloved by millions over 2,000 years, hold a special place in history. They hold a special place in human literature. You know, Jesus himself could say in confidence in Luke 21, 23, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And finally, Jesus is unique in his claims to deity. Biblical faith makes a revolutionary assertion. The creator God of the universe, he came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, he lived among us. According to both the Old and the New Testaments, the coming of Jesus consists of nothing less than God with us. It's not a guru, not just a holy man, not a religious founder, not a wise man or just a political leader. Jesus is the only figure in history to claim to be God 
and backed it up by living proofs. In his book, Evidence to Man's Verdict, Josh McDowell points out that there are three areas of Jesus' life that points to his deity. The first one is his direct claims. These include numerous references uh, to himself in which he states unequivocally his equality with the Father. We can read in John 10 and John 14, you know, uh, at his mock trial before the Sanhedrin, he answered the Jewish leader's question of his divinity by saying, well, you say that I am. That's found in, in Mark 14, 62. It's really, it's a Greek idiom for saying yes. When questioned about his age and authority in John 8, he famously declared, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Equating himself directly with the eternally existent God. The second area McDowell talks about is that Jesus reveals his indirect claims to divinity. Norman Geisler lists seven ref- 17 references in which Jesus used terms that equated himself to God. They include being the creator in John 1, the savior in John 4, the forgiver of sins in Mark 2, the first and the last in Revelation 1, the judge in Matthew 25, the redeemer in Revelation 5, and finally the Bible reveals 16 different titles that Jesus openly shared in unique relationship to the Father. I'm not going to go through them because they're there. Albert Wells sums up the unique aspect of the deity of Jesus, and he says this, Not one recognized religious leader, not Moses, Paul, Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, etc., have ever claimed to be God. That is, with the exception of Jesus Christ. Christ is the only religious leader who has ever claimed to be deity and the only individual ever who has convinced a great portion of the world that he is God. There is nobody like Jesus. Selena nails it. There is nobody like Jesus. In all of history past and all of time to come, there is one person who stands alone. He's above all others. There is salvation in no other name. This person is Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There is nobody like Jesus. He's a father to the orphans. He's a husband to the widow. He's a spring of water to a weary, dry land. He's the bright and morning star. Matter of fact, you can look up in your Bible that he's honey in the rock. He's the brightness of God's glory. He's the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. He's the expressed image of God. He's the pearl of great prize. And let us not forget that he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. The government rests upon his shoulders. If I go a little bit deeper, there's nobody like Jesus. He's my rod and my staff. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no no evil, for he is with me. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. He is the creator of all. He is the keeper of creation. He always was, always is, always will be. He is unmoved, unchanged, undefeated. He is never outdone. His promises are sure. His goodness is limited. His mercy, when you think about it, is everlasting and even new every morning. His word never changes. His love will endure. His grace is sufficient. He is caring. He is loving. He is eternal. He is faithful. He is great. He is holy. He is mighty. He is merciful. He is true. He is everlasting. He reigns in righteousness. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He was bruised and he brings healing. He was pierced and he eases pain. He was persecuted and he brought freedom. He was killed and he brought forth life. He is goodness, he is kindness, he is gentleness. He is holy, he is righteous, he is mighty, he is powerful, he is pure. His ways are right, his ways are true, his word is eternal 
and his will is unchanging. He is redeemer. He is savior. He is guide. He is peace. And when you think about it, he is my joy, my comfort, my Lord, and the ruler of my life. There is nobody like Jesus. And he will never leave me. He'll never overlook me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never mislead me. Or he will never forget me. He is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time and every way. If you fall, he will lift you up. If you fail, he will forgive. If you are weak, he is strong. If you get lost, he is the way. If you hurt, he is your healing. When you are broken, he will mend you. If you are blind, he will lead you. And when you're hungry, he will feed you. If you face trials, he'll be with you. When you face persecution, he will shield you. When you have a problem, he will comfort you. When you are facing loss, he'll provide for you. And finally, in death, he will be with you. Selena's got it right. There is nobody like him. He's indescribable because he is incomprehensible. He's irresistible. And he's invisible. And you can't get him off your hands and you can't get him off your minds. You can't outlive him and yet we can't do life without him. I don't know about you, but he is my Savior, and he is my friend, and there's nobody like Jesus. Let's pray. God, our provider, we gather as a church today needing you in very different ways, and some of us need strength because we are facing a big challenge. Some of us need hope because we are feeling like giving up. Some of us need love because we're feeling alone. And God, we trust that you will provide for us, whether through words or through music or in a quiet moment of reflection. We do know that in this moment that you are here and you are with us. And so now, Jesus, we, we look for you in the spaces of our lives, the spaces between maybe what I've done and what I've left undone, the spaces between my convictions and my actions, the spaces between all that I hope to do and maybe what I've already actually done. And so we come with humility, knowing that I can't always see the way that I disappoint you, nor can I always see the long-term effects of the good that I've done, but this is a prayer that we take today for the road ahead. And really, the road ahead for all of us is an empty space stretching before us and We ask that you'd fill us, God, with a burning compassion for my brothers and my sisters that you've placed on this journey with me. And that you would give us all a love that will not let us go. God, I pray for courage to give boldly, to love simply, to hope deeply, to risk greatly. I recognize that my light is small, my time is short, but may it shine for you. Always, ever, always for you. And God, honestly, I do know that my prayers are not echoing in empty chambers or ricocheting into nothingness, but you have listened to every word. And you come not always with quick fixes, not always with the solutions that I've planned, but you teach me that every road is walkable with you beside me. You're steady voice gently guides me. And you are the faithful one from generation to generation. And now I pray that you would open our eyes to see that there is just nobody like you. Amen. In ancient time, the one who blessed extended his hands for a blessing. Those receiving the blessing did likewise. The soul sanctuary, here you go. 
Soul Sanctuary, go into your week with your ears pitched to the sound of God's voice calling your name. Go into your week with your eyes peeled for the face of Jesus in unexpected places. Go into your week with your soul poised to receive the spirit of God, the spirit of peace. And my brothers and sisters, look for Jesus. Seek him in the eyes of your loved ones and in the eyes of strangers. And may your heart burn within you as he draws close to you this week. Be blessed and now go and live the church. Amen.